The Senate Subcommittee on Poverty normally meets in Washington, but Robert Kennedy held today's hearing in this high school gymnasium in Kentucky's Appalachia. The witnesses from Kentucky's Hill Country told poignant stories of poverty-scarred lives, and Senator Kennedy found some sympathy for his view that the Vietnam War is draining off money that should go to the war on poverty. Our area is feeding the war machine. That's what we can teach our boys. They are being taught the gentle art of killing. They can't take the genteel route of draft dodging by getting in a college because they don't have the money nor they don't qualify for the National Guard because they have no influence. This is the last time that Appalachia South, a large number of us, will ever appeal to U.S. Democrat or Republicans. I don't know what road we'll take, but it will be a different new politic or what. They uh, know we need schools. The uh, uh, newsletters from different schools have uh, been circulated this morning. And it's shocking uh, what our children are forced to We have a uh, struggle that's taking place in uh, Southeast Asia and Vietnam that's taking a great part of the resources of this country. And uh, $30 billion. Some of that money should be coming down here into eastern Kentucky to deal with the problems and find jobs for people. When President Johnson first declared war on poverty four years ago, he came himself to Kentucky's Appalachia. But the Vietnam War has sapped much of the presidential vigor that once went into the poverty crusade. Robert Kennedy seemed to be saying today that he's ready to lead a new war on poverty anytime he gets the call. This is Bob Clark in Kentucky. and by sewage, and by the acid waste, which seeps down from the scarred hills above. Wrecked cars dot the landscape, and the men of these hills, who worked at great peril to themselves, and to their health and their very lives, these men, many of them who have been disabled by accident and affliction, have been left without work and without hope by the automation of an industry 
which no longer needed them. Riches still flow from these hills, but they do not benefit the vast majority of the people that live here. And I think that situation is intolerable. So the best... <laughs> so the best of your young, the best of the young men who are educated and trained are forced to leave Eastern Kentucky and go off to other parts of the nation and search for work. And the old and the sick and the weary and those who know no other life, who have been the coal miners who have made uh, this uh, part of the land, who contributed their strength and their sweat and their skill and their courage to making uh, this part of the disaster that has befallen the people of the mountains. The work experience and training program, which many people call the Happy Pappies, has kept info income flowing into many households where there was no other hope. And the food stamp program has brought food to many who would otherwise have been close to starvation. And the maternal and infant care funds provided by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare have provided prenatal and pediatric care to many mothers for the first time. All of this is worthwhile. But there's still great hunger. Family after family still survives on beans and potatoes and gravy and rice, on cornbread and fatback. In too many households, the food and which the food stamps buy runs out in the third or the fourth week of the month. Buying of food stamps consumes a great portion of an already meager welfare check. In Kentucky, more than half the adult men, sometimes over three quarters, have no work. We have done much, but in my judgment, we have much, much more to do in the future. This is one of the proudest regions of the nation. We must all work together. Kentuckians and all Americans to bring <laughs> who has led the fight in the Congress of the United States for Eastern Kentucky. So we have much more to do at the federal level. We have much more to do, I'm sure, here in the state, and I'm, I'm sure there's much more that can be done in the part of Eastern Kentucky by the people themselves. And all of us working together, all of us recognizing our responsibilities, in my judgment, we can have some success. Uh, we can do much better than we've done in the past. We can develop. Here we are, a country with $800 billion, a gross national product of $800 billion. Delighted to have you. That you, Senator Kennedy, have left an extremely busy schedule in Washington and the great cities to come here must have a heartwarming effect on every Appalachian mountaineer. It is doubtful that any land or people has contributed more to the national welfare than those within the Eastern Kentucky coal field or received less in return. It is sincerely hoped that these hearings indicate that at last the federal government is determined to redress this ancient and deadly imbalance. <laughs> Hunger has lurked within the Southern Appalachians for many generations. As long ago as 1863, President Abraham Lincoln told General O. O. Howard, the head of his Bureau of Freedmen and Refugees, that at the conclusion of the Great War, then raging, the national government must find a way of aiding the poor people of the Southern Mountains, whom the world had for so long passed by and forgotten. <clears throat> Hunger still lurks within the Southern Mountains. Its sinister shadow will darken this land and the lives of the people who inhabit it until certain basic and far-reaching reforms on annual new grounds. For generations they cleared and burned and plowed new fields spring after starvation, they wore out their lands. Hollow by hollow they moved up the creeks and valleys, seeking for new coals to clear. At last, everywhere over the mountain range, the people had spread new grounds to clear. When the cultivable land was exhausted, the people were faced with disaster. Thousands and this outflow of people that continues to this day. 
Thus from the beginning, the region was afflicted by one of the two banes that brought Ireland to starvation in the 1840s, a primitive, wholly inadequate system of agriculture. Yes. Last year, Kentucky was the nation's number two coal producer, turning out 99 and a half million tons of the fuel. But all is not well with coal. And others are under construction and 51 are on the drawing boards. Thousands of men will lose their jobs. Scores of pits will close and long lines of men will be seen again, waiting for their commodity foods, food stamps, and unemployment. The plan for this kind of eventuality is now before the disaster strikes again and before similarly any segment of our economy can be subjected to abrupt and highly traumatic shifts. Not even are wholly immune from the kind of fast-breaking development feuds onto the sidewalks almost overnight. Help us to save our land and you will help us to... Help us. Of Eastern Kentucky, and from the sweat and the labor of the people of Eastern Kentucky, is startling indeed, and something that, uh, is a, as I said at the beginning, is a, a matter that that the people. Uh, one of these uh, very large entities. Uh, which on um, whose land? And uh, what did you say there, profits were? What percentage? Uh, that company uh, had uh, profits of Round. and leasing mineral companies are earning fabulous profits by national norms. And very little of that money is I suppose that uh, today, if we were left to county resources alone, we would keep our... A panel of community residents, Robert Messer from Clay County. Hey, you sit down or you can... Are you, are you on your way out? Goodbye. <laughs> Davis and I'm from Pike County and I'm a welfare recipient so I help in plants and I've got to and they pay into the to whatever that, that comes back out of so I can't and they've got families so I can't depend on them and they said mommy said why don't you break a pass keeping and just come and stay with us but I can't see me having to break a pass keeping after I raised all my family and take this little boy of mine now, I've still got him to raise. So I'm not getting enough to go on. And I might could work at a light job, but I'm not very strong. Since I've raised all these kids, I'm not I'm not able to work at no hard job or nothing like that. No. Well thank you very much, Davis. And uh, this school lunch program, I think these school children should put it up a little higher. This school lunch program, I think it. We need more roads. We need better roads. We don't have roads fit to travel on. And the food stamps, I think we should have, they should be free to offer. Or if I don't get more welfare, I think we should not have to pay $28 for $40 worth out of that one little $101 I get. Um, what, the, how much do you pay for the school lunch? Uh, 30, Thirty cents a cent. day, so that would be a uh, dollar and a half a week. That'd be about six dollars. It was five dollars a month, but since it's went up to thirty, it's about six something. Like this. And do you find that you, your neighbors have the same kind of problem? They all have. We all have the same problem. They all pay. And these tender garden children are not supposed to be a paying uh, a further lunch at all. That, to my understanding about it, but they're charging them thirty cents a day. And this, uh, uh, problem with the, this program they've got, uh, in Pike, Harry Osborne and them, I think to them they don't want to give you nothing or don't want to help you no way without you bringing a big whole community in on them or in with them. 
They don't want to take my work for it. And so they get their money. Uh, what they do with their money, us back in our part, don't know where it goes to. We don't get any of it. All right, well, thank you, Mrs. Davis. That was very helpful. I didn't try to give you a few points. I'm an old retired miner. I know what this is, and done. come along in 60 now. I'll give you a little sketch of it in 60. We was a running, had 140, 244 ton of coal a day. That's what we was running with 144 men. You know, I come along just in a little bit of time then. They uh, moved this machinery in. You know what they done? They run 300 and 25 ton of coal there with 22 men. That was all out of addition, you see. Took the work all away from us. See? They run that more, much more coal with 22 men and what we would run with that 150, so far. And you see that just coming on down then, you see, moving on up the road, down. Here it is now, we enter the father's people, you know, we happy pappy. If that hadn't come into our country, I don't see what we would have done. I don't see what the poor people would have done. I don't, they come to close their kids. They come to school their kids. They come to fed them at school. Well, come. It's pitiful to get around these places where these people is leading this year. Yeah. I thank you good people for spending your time and coming down here and helping us work these problems out if we can get more for our poor people and all live better and fire better. And uh, another thing I want to thank you for is for this year welfare. Now we had some pillars on welfare down in our country and the one thing about that I don't like that much. This doctor, five years, been another doctor. He worked on this happy pappy. He worked as long as he could. They cut him off, you see. He couldn't stand it. They cut him off. And every once in a while, we'd work around and get him back on. And it took one year to get that man on the welfare after he was completely cut off. Now we've got another case down our way. This man's got 14 in family. And uh, He's, he's, he's getting his last check now. He's cut off. And if it takes that long to get him on there, I, it's going to be pitiful for them 14 in family. Do you think this, uh, Mr. Hamilton, do you think this hunger in your uh, county? Yeah, lots of hunger. We was placed here not long ago at some kids. Like, I hate to tell this, there's a girl, I think, about seven or eight years old. Big snow on the ground and barefooted, no shoes, go out of school. Uh, Appalachia got out and Hope got out and fixed her up some shoes and got her some food to eat so the girl could go on to school. We thank you now. I thank you for being here. And thank you folks for coming down here. But I, I'd rather all of these year government programs, we'd all work together and not work again one another and all go together. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Mr. Duff, could you change the courthouse level? <laughs> there are great ones say bootstrap operations. Help yourself before you ask the government help. Try it. There is no more reactionary groups on the face of the earth than are found in our courthouses in Appalachia. You go on from that, you find it in the state house. I hope we don't find it. I find evidence to the contrary, Senator that you do understand their problem. We know they do here. They understand it, but they don't want us to do anything about it. <laughs> Our teachers are appointed a political whim. <laughs> we 
we, we have teachers with the same qualification that draws different pay scales. That's due to political whim. Everything we ask them for, they roads. We don't have money for uh, schools. We don't have money. What do we have money for? You take. Uh, we've had uh, committee hearings like this before. Nothing's ever came up. Our area's the same. The welfare program, with all the billions that's been pouring into it, you go from house to house and find one penny's evidence of it. All these... I suggest that the people in our area that are assembled here today with all courtesy and respect for Senator Kennedy and in memory of his brother whom I loved and Congressman Perkins, that we ask him to allow we the people to take over one meeting on poverty and really hear what bugs us, what stops us. I'll repeat, when you leave and we start a program, we will be met with opposition at the courthouse level. We'll go no further. <laughs> and, and then again, I would suggest a panel be picked from each area represented here. You and the congressman can be our honored guest and see one poverty meeting run by the people. Let the people be one. You see, at this, at this hearing, we've made an effort, as you can see from the list of witnesses and the fact that uh, we've asked to have you come to hear from the people who, are, who know themselves firsthand who have suffered poverty and know what the conditions are and know what needs to be done. We're not having this hearing to try to hear from others who can tell uh, third hand what the conditions are, what the situation is. Uh, we've gone to you and we're delighted to have you here and we're delighted to have your complaints and we're delighted to have your suggestions and ideas and thoughts about what needs to be done. I can't come here, however, and promise that all of these problems are going to disappear. You've indicated quite clearly in your own testimony but some of the difficulties. Beyond that, I think we could do much more than we are doing in this country. I don't think that it's acceptable. Uh, as I've said before, with the gross national product that this country has, I can't come here, however, and I never have come here and promise that all the problems are going to disappear from the, because of our committee. But we are focusing attention on what needs to be done. We are hearing from people such as yourselves who can give us suggestions and ideas of what needs to be done. And we'll bring them home, back to Washington. We'll work on them. And I would hope that the state would work on them at the same time, and the county, and the people here, the political people. I would like to say that we need roads, and we will have them. We could name... I'm standing up for the rights of a student, his teachers. What education he's going to get, let it be good. When you graduate from a school in Harlan County, you have just about the same education as a person that graduated from the eighth grade. As there were some statements made uh, regarding individuals and regarding the principal of the school before uh, this hearing ends if any of those who have been mentioned and feel that they uh, want to make, uh, give any I'm quite sure. I'm quite sure if you'd put your signature on it that, um, What would you like me to do? I'm quite sure if you'd put your signature on an excuse. 
if it would be excused. Well, what, what, what should I say you were doing? <laughs> oh, uh, um, no, let, let me just go. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be glad to uh, let them know that you've been down here. Uh, and I would be glad to uh, call the school. I'll have one of my assistants call the school and tell them that well, you came and testified and that uh, you were asked to testify before the committee. There are students here from three different schools in the county. Uh, there are students representing Kaywood High School, which incidentally was named after the county superintendent. <laughs> Cumberland High School and Everett's High School. So there would be three schools. All right. If you would talk to... Uh, uh, Mr. Tom Johnston, who comes from uh, Kentucky, one of the outstanding figures of the whole state. <laughs> if you would talk to him and give him the name of your, the schools that are involved, I would be glad to call and tell them that you were uh, down here. In the meantime, it seems uh, difficult to believe that anybody would be suspended, uh, particularly as the conditions of the Not school are... Not suspended, indefinitely what? suspended. Excuse me? Indefinitely that suspended. That anybody would be indefinitely suspended for bringing the attention of uh, the school authorities, the conditions in the school, if they didn't know it themselves, then perhaps uh, the principal would reconsider. I'd be interested in finding out if the principal, I mean, obviously, this is not, uh, I'm not running the school, but I would be interested in seeing if, as you obviously take good pictures, and, uh, and obviously you write well, that I would think that, uh, that uh, you'd be a student uh, that uh, would be worthwhile uh, having in the school. Uh, I, and obviously, they... So. Uh, does, uh, we're, uh, we have an education bill that's before Congress this year, uh, which amounts to more than $10 billion. Some of the causes of poverty. This is a matter that is of, your testimony is a matter of, of great one interest to the committee. One more thing about the... Uh... Well, let me make one more statement about the... Mm -hmm. I'm a personal, mm -hmm. I personally believe in the food stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that there's a lot of food that we need to be when President Johnson first declared the war on poverty four years ago, he came himself to Kentucky's Appalachian. But the Vietnam War has sapped much of the presidential vigor that once went into the poverty crusade. Robert Kennedy seemed to be saying today that he's... This Senate Subcommittee on Poverty normally meets in Washington, but Robert Kennedy held today's hearing in this high school gymnasium in Kentucky's Appalachia. The witnesses from Kentucky's Hill Country told poignant stories of poverty-scarred lives. And Senator Kennedy found some sympathy for his view that the Vietnam War is draining off money that should go to the war on poverty.